Carolina, I'm sending you a message, okay? Okay. So just get ready for it. Okay. Hello and welcome to Beba Epstein, The Extraordinary Life of an Ordinary Girl, in partnership with the Yibo Bruce and Francesca Cernia Slobin Online Museum. My name is Jordana Gessler, and I am the Vice President of Education and Exhibits at Holocaust Museum LA. If you're joining us for the first time, we're pleased to have you. A little bit about the museum first, um, for, those of us, for those of you who are new. Holocaust Museum LA is the first survivor-founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. We were founded in the 1960s when a group of survivors met and discovered that each of them had a photograph, document, or personal item from before the war. They decided that these artifacts needed a permanent home where they could be displayed safely and in perpetuity. They also wanted to create a place to memorize, to memorialize their relatives who perished and help to educate the public so that no one would ever forget. We are excited to welcome YIVO's executive director and CEO, Jonathan Brent, Chief Curator of the YIVO Bruce and Francesca Cernia Slobin Online Museum, Carolina Zukrowski, and Beba Epstein's son, Michael, today to learn more about the, the exhibit and discuss the use of primary sources in Holocaust education. At Holocaust Museum LA, we understand the power that primary sources and personal narratives offer students in their quest to better understand history. The belief in the sharing of personal narratives within the broader historical context is the foundation for our education programming and serves as a basis to begin teaching about the Holocaust and relaying the universal and valuable lessons learned from it. For example, our own comprehensive Common Core Curricula aligned teacher guides give teachers the tools to teach the Holocaust to students through Holocaust survivor testimony and primary sources. Using as examples, students created short films about the lives of Holocaust survivors. In all of our work, including our tours of the museum, Holocaust survivor testimony and oral history are important components of Holocaust education and remembrance. It allows listeners and students to personalize the history and form personal connections and relationships, each with their own unique experiences. It is quite remarkable that not only did people survive the horrific ordeals we were able to adjust to normal society after the war, and this speaks volumes to students in our community. Our galleries contain images, artifacts, primary sources, and documents from our archival collections. Each primary source directly relates to and creates historical context for understanding this important history. By utilizing different sources, historians, educators, and students can create historical narratives, providing a fuller understanding of this complex history. Holocaust history is multi-layered and intricate. Therefore, we curate our exhibits and education programs to allow students a better understanding of the larger history through survivor stories and primary sources, which really does encourage them to think analytically about the sources presented and the social relevancy of Holocaust history today, which is why we're so honored to host the program to hear not only about the incredible and poignant story of Bebe Epstein, 
with the transformative and creative ways in which Yivo has brought her story to life and truly honored the importance of Holocaust education. There will be time at the conclusion of the discussion for questions and answer. Please share any questions that you may have in the Q&A box and we will get to them. It is now my pleasure to welcome Jonathan. Thank you very much, uh, Jordana. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to uh, meet with uh, your community today and, and speak a bit about uh, the Evo Institute. Thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, for those of you, I'm gonna say a few words about the Evo Institute. For those of you who don't know much about it, uh, as a way of helping to frame what you will hear subsequently from Carolina. The Evo Institute was founded in 1925 in Vilna, Poland at that time, now Vilnius, Lithuania. And uh, it began with the goal of becoming the first academy of higher learning of the Jewish people of Eastern Europe and Russia. That meant it was going to be the first, essentially the first university uh, of that uh, whole period and of that history. There had been nothing like it before. But how do you study this history? How do you uh, analyze it? The only way is to collect material. And none of the material had been collected up to now. Folklore, music, theater, literature, uh, political, social organizations. And so the Evo Institute set about to collect as much material as possibly it could. It had uh, collectors all over the world of Ashkenazi descent sending materials to Vilna. Uh, and building this enormous archive and library there for the purpose of studying this history. Um, in 1941, the Nazis came and they understood uh, what the Evo Institute was. And so instead of burning everything to the ground, they decided to steal as much as possible. And uh, I thought I would show you a, uh, an image of what that uh, looked like in reality. Uh, the Evo Institute was turned into a huge warehouse by the Germans and books and manuscripts were sorted by Evo uh, workers uh, impressed into service by the Germans. This is a photograph that was taken by the Germans of Schmerke Katriginski, the poet, and Avram Sutzkever, uh, the well-known poet, sorting books and manuscripts for transport uh, to Frankfurt, Germany, where they were going to become part of the foundation of the Institute for the, uh, uh, for the, uh, the study of the Jewish people after the war, and also for the Museum of the Extinct People in Prague that was going to be built in Prague. Here is a photograph of these same materials being uh, uh, brought to the train station uh, on lorries uh, to be shipped back. Here is a photograph of those materials that had been shipped back to YIVO that had relocated to New York City uh, and, and these materials had been found by the U.S. Army in 1945 and were shipped back to New York. Uh, now, not all of the materials that belong to YIVO are in those boxes. Uh, just as Schmerke Katriginski and Avram Sutzkever sorted materials to send to Frankfurt, they also hid material that they thought was of special importance uh, on their bodies, essentially, and under their arms and in every way imaginable and brought these materials into the Vilna ghetto where they were then buried or given to non-Jewish friends to preserve for the duration of the war. And so the Evo uh, 
uh, archive and library were literally ripped apart, ripped in half. The, do, the, the autobiography of Beba Epstein was among those materials that were brought back into the ghetto and hidden and dug up after the war. Um, there have been multiple discoveries of these materials uh, over the years, uh, beginning in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. But the diary, the, the autobiography of Beba Epstein was not discovered until 2017 when the National Library of Lithuania made a thorough search of all of its premises. Um, I will stop sharing. So, YIVO became this great archive and library. And it, it had materials from all over the Jewish world. And in fact, it became uh, the first organization in the world to start collecting material about the Holocaust uh, in the Warsaw ghetto, in the Vilna ghetto, in the Lodz ghetto and elsewhere. And these materials are now part of our collection in New York City, where we have approximately 7 million documents and objects pertaining to the Holocaust, the second largest collection in the world outside of Yad Vashem. Among all of the materials that we have is a vast uh, set of eyewitness accounts. Uh, these materials have never been digitized. Uh, these materials, uh, though scholars come to study them, have never really become known by the general public. And so once the discoveries of materials were made in Vilnius, we began to ask ourselves, how do we make this material known to the general public? Because that is our obligation. How do we, how do we make uh, uh, these materials part of scholarly discussion, part of the, the, the project of building a true account of uh, the, the Jewish experience before World War II, during the war and after. And it occurred to us that since we are not a museum and don't have the facilities uh, to display materials, uh, uh, with anything like in anything like the quantity that we need to be able to do. The only way of uh, achieving our aim was through uh, constructing an online museum, an online museum that would take specific objects and put them in context and make them available to the entire world. And this is what the Bruce and Francesca Chernius Sloven Online Museum is. Uh, the exhibit of Beba Epstein's autobiography uh, is the first uh, exhibition. There will be many, many others. Uh, there will be other autobiography, youth autobiographies that will become the subject of the exhibition. The story of the Yiddish language uh, will become an exhibition. Uh, there will be exhibitions on posters, on political movements, on a whole variety of uh, the experience of Jews of Eastern Europe um, from the YIVO archives. And the YIVO archives are vast, 24 million documents and objects. We have the rarest uh, 18th century rabbinical manuscripts, and we have a singular uh, uh, collection of Yiddish pornography. We have uh, the autobiographies of Jewish youth in the 1920s and 30s, and we have the autobiography of, uh, of uh, Chagall. We have the stories of uh, Sholem Aleichem and, and Yud Lamed Peretz, and we also have the novels of Chaim Grada. 
uh, we have uh, just a wonderland of materials. And so I will stop now, but I invite everyone to come and visit the YIVO website, learn about the programs that we have, learn about the collections that we have, learn about the educational opportunities at the YIVO Institute and participate uh, in the project of discovery that the YIVO Institute truly affords. So thank you very much. And I will turn this over to Carolina who will tell you much more about the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just want to start by saying that it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the Holocaust Museum LA for generously organizing the event. Uh, so as Jonathan was saying, the purpose of the museum is to tell the story of Jewish life in Eastern Europe and Russia. And the way we do this is by following the life um, of a person. So our first exhibition focuses on the life of Beba Epstein. And um, as has been mentioned before, the basis for this exhibition is her autobiography, which was written in the 1933-34 school year when she was around 11 years old. And from her autobiography, we expanded into her whole life. And by following a person's life, you can learn about many different topics. It creates empathy. And when you care about knowing more regarding that person, it can connect you to all that was happening around them. We think that it serves as a type of springboard to create interest for history. And uh, history itself, culture, economy, government policies, none of it happens in a vacuum. And what we worked towards here was to always make the connection between her life and the historical context around her and how they influenced and had very real consequences in her life. And uh, Beba's life was chosen because it was not unlike that of many children today. So she loved her family, she went to school, she had summer holidays in resort towns, went to summer camps, wanted to go to college someday. And yet because of prejudice, her entire life as she knew it was destroyed. And by choosing a life that is similar to that of many children today, irrespective of their faith or background, we can show that hate is uncalled for and will continue to happen if we don't stand up against it. So now I'm go going to give you a short tour of the um, exhibition. So let me share my screen here to get started. Here. All right. So this here is a table of contents. I just want to start here to show you everything we have available. We focus on her life before, during, and after the Holocaust. So the storyline of the exhibition is divided into chapter, and each chapter focuses on a specific topic. You can follow the whole story from beginning to end, or you can explore individual chapters, as all of them are full stories in and of themselves. Uh, so as you can see, the first six chapters are all about her life before the war. And then we go into her war experience, immigration, and her life later on. Um, so each chapter contains several layers of information that enable you to explore the content in greater depth. So now I'm going to start here in chapter two. And this here is where Beba presents her family. We use this as an opportunity to talk about all the changes that were happening between the mid 1800s and the early 1900s in Jewish communities. The main content of each chapter is Beba's story as told by her. So in this specific one, we adapted into animations Beba's account of her grandparents, parents, and siblings from her autobiography. And here on the left side, we always have a timeline that shows the main historical events that were happening at the time to tie her story into the bigger historical context. And then we have what we call historical context boxes, um, which offer further information about the historical context of the time. In the animations, she mentions topics that might not be known by everyone. So we explain those in a bit more detail here. Um, and if you know it already, you don't need to go through everything. And from here, whenever possible, we also connect to uh, resources to learn even more deeply about a specific subject. Uh, so some of the links are gonna take you to the Eva Encyclopedia, which is the most complete resource about history and culture of Jews in Eastern Europe. If someone is interested in a specific topic here, they can learn in great depth about it. 
So the idea of this structure is to mimic that rabbit hole that we have all fallen into online of going deeper and deeper and deeper into a subject. But in here, everything is always coming from trusted sources. And finally, we have a selection of what effects, um, which are documents, videos, photographs, objects, songs from the archives that expand the main topic of that specific chapter. Some related specifically to Beba's story, like family letters and other personal documents that we used in research, while others deal with the general topic of uh, the chapter. So for example, this chapter talks a lot, a lot about life for Jews in the pay of settlement. And in one of the animations, Beba, talk, uh, Beba talks about how marveled she was that her grandfather was able to travel around and how her grandmother really wanted to visit other places but was never able to. So in that context box that I just showed, we talk about travel restrictions to Jews in the pay of settlement. Jews needed authorization to do so. And here in the artifacts, one of our selections is a permit for a Jew to travel outside of the pale. So this shows here how everything is connected within the exhibition. And um, we also have an ever relevant a set of maps to situate where you are in that specific chapter. And this is relevant, especially in this exhibition because of all the border changes that happened in the span of the story. So for example, in this chapter, we have World War I and then Russian Empire becomes the Soviet Union, Poland is again an independent country and then all the borders changed. Uh, so the idea is that every user can explore the exhibition at their own pace, stop and come back whenever they want to. So some of the chapters are going to be more interactive, some more passive, some shorter, some longer. And each feature was chosen based on what would be the best way to showcase co the content while you're still keeping the audience engaged. And we always um, have available more or less how long it's gonna take for you to uh, go through a chapter so that you know what you're getting yourself into here. And uh, now I'm going to show some highlights of the exhibition, including both experiences and some individual chapters. So I am going to start with chapter one, where we present Beba. So this content here was adapted from her autobiography and transformed in scroll animations. And here you can learn a little bit more about her personality. And in the artifact section of this chapter, we feature Beba's full autobiography. And I have it open here already. Uh, we have the full original in Yiddish, and also we offer a full English translation. And I highly recommend that you read all of it because it's a really fascinating account. Moving on, um, we have chapter four, which uh, focuses on schools and education. So we start with a dialogue between Beba's grandfather and a bookstore worker. So Beba says that her grandfather always bought books for the kids who couldn't afford, so they just could go and pick them up in the bookstore. He valued education and wanted everyone to have access to it. So then you can also go and pick up your book um, and have a look at several different schools that Jewish children could attend at the time. So here is one example. We always start with um, an explanation of what the school was, and then we show the spreads uh, of a notebook from that school with a summary below the content. So here you have um, detailed description of a chicken, you have a section on how to make cheese. This is a Marx and New section in the notebook about anatomy, and uh, you have this beautiful illustration that a student made of a skeleton and its corresponding bones. And in here, it's a description of breathing mechanisms and uh, on the right page, a detailed illustration of skin layers. Beba's notebook is um, an adaptation of notebooks that we could find in the archives of her school. We also happen to have the remnants of her primary school, the Sofia Gorevich. Um, so we know they learned in Yiddish um, and they also had uh, classes in Polish as mandated by the Polish government. They learned math. Uh, biology, there was music too. So we have some Yiddish songs, classical music. One of her favorite activities was when her teacher would read them books. So we made a selection of books that were uh, popular in Yiddish at the time. And some of the titles are titles that everyone's going to recognize today, like Tom Sawyer, Robinson Crusoe. Others were uh, originally published in Russian and then translated into Yiddish, like Three Bears and Dr. Owit Hertz. 
and Yingot Singokvat, which was originally published in uh, Yiddish. So then you can see that they did not leave um, in, in not everyone lived in insular communities. So she had access to things from outside as well. And uh, we have uh, we produce videos with Ekthrazil and Eshmalensum reading parts of those books. And in this one specifically, there was no translation to English. So we translated the full book and we made it available in the exhibition as well. Um, and then we also talk a little bit about anti-Semitism in the section. It was 1933 um, and there was a lot of things that were already going on. And uh, in Baba's testimony after the war, she talks about how she would have discussions with her father. Um, he hoped she would be able to go to university, but with all the anti-Semitism in Poland, she wasn't sure if she would be able to do so either in Vilna or Warsaw. So maybe they discussed if she could go to Paris instead, for example. Um, so now we're going to move on to chapter five, which focuses on Vilna in the 1930s. And here we have a selection of eight parts of the city to explore in 3D reconstructions. Some of them are specific to Beba's experience, like her home and the schools she attended. And others are important parts of the city for the Jewish community, like the great synagogue and the Strachan library area. So I have this one open here already. And uh, in here, you can look around, explore, and then use the arrows to move into the next stop. Um, and if you click on those red dots, you're going to learn more about what has been highlighted with pictures and texts and resources. Uh, so the Great Synagogue is no longer standing in Vilna. And um, this here, in this section here, we have the Market Hall, which still exists in Vilnius. And here is Baba waiting for you um, to, to buy ingredients to bake. So the thing with this reconstruction is that um, Vilnius wasn't destroyed like other cities during the war, but the Jewish buildings, they were either destroyed at some point or repurposed. And most importantly, the majority of the Jewish population is no longer there anymore. Um, in this one here, if you click on the red dot, we are going to see some pictures of the market. And we also connected to um, a hamantaschen recipe from one of Evo's Shine Online classes. Evo has a lot of resources beyond the museum, and we connect them in the exhibition whenever possible. And uh, if you click on the arrow, it's going to take you to the next um, stop. And in here, we recreated the outdoor market that you just saw in the pictures. Uh, so there is a lot to be explored in this chapter alone. Um, and coming back here, I just want to highlight that um, we have a lot of artifacts relating to the city um, of Vilna. And uh, there are drawings and pictures of the city, Yiddish theater posters and photos. We even have a notice of a cow theft and uh, four clips of the Jewish quarter in Vilna in 1929. So moving on with our tour here, um, we're going now to chapter seven, which focuses on the world context leading up to the war. So this is also a 3D exploration, but of the world, you can zoom in and out and spin. And we have highlighted several countries um, where I explore their economy and immigration policies following the Great Depression. So in most of the countries that we have featured here, there were restrictions that were imposed um, uh, especially on Jewish immigration in the 1930s. And we, um, of course, also talk about what was going on in Germany uh, with the aftermath of World War I, the ascension of the Nazi power, of the Nazi party Hitler in power. Um, we talk also about the Evian Conference, Kristallnacht, and the Nuremberg Laws. Um, so now we get into chapter eight, which uh, Beba presents her experience during the Holocaust. So this chapter is based on text, documents, and testimonials, and uh, it is divided into four parts. Whenever a relevant historic aspect is presented by Beba, we expand into that historical context in the, those boxes. So for example, we start with the occupation of Vilna by the Soviets in 1939, um, following the Ribbentrop-Molotov pact. So we explain what it is here. And uh, soon later, they transferred Vilna to Lithuania, and Baba mentions how they had to now speak Lithuanian school, and the city was renamed Vilnius. 
And at this point, life moved on and they thought things would be all right. So there is even a family letter, this one here, um, where it's mentioned that Baba was planning a trip to Minsk in the summer of 1940. So the second part um, is about the German invasion of Unius, which happened the day after Baba's high school graduation. So the ghetto is established and she's sent to hide with a family outside the ghetto. Letters are sent back and forth and at some point they stop and Beba goes into the ghetto to discover that her whole family had been murdered. She then takes various jobs and stay there, stays there until the, the ghetto is liquidated. And we talk about in the context boxes about life in ghettos, um, about Jewish resistance as well, because Beba is also part of the Jewish resistance of the resistance in the Vilna ghetto too. And the third part focuses on the many places she sent after, including to a factory that used the labor of Jewish prisoners. In 1944, she ends up at Stutthof, which she calls her Auschwitz because it was the worst part for her. And um, this is what we believe could be her entry in the Stutthof logbook. And she um, stays there until the end of the war. So the last part is about the final moments. Uh, she was not part of the death march because she was sick and she was taken into boats in a German attempt to evacuate the camp in May 1945. And this is Beba in 1984 giving her testimony to the Los Angeles Holocaust Testimonies Project. We interspersed parts of her testimony with um, text and pictures and other archival documents. Um, I cannot go through her entire um, story here. It is... Um, a lot, but I really suggest you read the whole chapter. Uh, she ends up in a hospital in Sweden at the end of the war. She um, is rescued by the British army and is able to board a Red Cross boat to Sweden. And um, I just want to make some points as to why her story is extremely interesting and uh, for those who are learning about the Holocaust specifically. So the first one is that she's a girl who goes through this by herself. So although extremely sad and heartbreaking, it is also empowering. And it's not to say that she wasn't helped or that she didn't help other people throughout the way. She did uh, both happen to her, but there is no big savior in her story, uh, which are so many of the stories that we hear about the Holocaust, but was not the experience of the majority of the Jews during the war. And she goes through many diverse experiences, as I just explained. So through her life, uh, one can learn about several experiences they just could go through during the war. And finally, it is also very real. There is no romanticizing of heroes or how she survived. So a family hid her in their attic, but she knew that they were getting something out of it. They had her family's belongings. And she did what she had to do to survive. At some point, she and other women beat another Jewish girl because her behavior was potentially dangerous to the other Jewish women around them. And in this chapter here, we have a selection of artifacts pertaining to the war. So one of the objects that I want to highlight is this Rosh Hashanah album that uh, was made by the children of the Yush Ghetto to the leader of the Yudenbrat, Rumkowski. So um, every school in the ghetto, the children made a drawing and then they all signed their names. Of the approximately 14,000 children who signed, um, only around 200 of those survived. And we also have one of the logbooks from Auschwitz. Uh, many of the names on these pages are crossed out, which means that they were uh, murdered by the Nazis. Moving on to chapter nine, um, in here, uh, we are going to go through her immigration experience right after the war. So she survived, she's in Sweden, and she needs to figure out what she's going to do next. Um, so she uh, decides to immigrate to the United States with the help of her uncle Lazar Epstein, her father's brother, who lived in New York at the time. So we organize the section as a detective game. You have to find clues and answer the questions correctly, or you're going to be stuck, just like an actual attempt at immigrating. Uh, and then in the end, we go through uh, what it would be like if she tried to immigrate in 2020. Long story short, she would very likely not succeed and her life would have been completely different. She wouldn't be able to reunite with one of her last living family members. And this would also be true for many other countries, not just the United States. 
And uh, we close with um, chapter 10, which tells her story after the war in the United States and the beautiful life and family she built. Um, and uh, I just want to show here that uh, we close the exhibition with a beautiful piece by Michael's son, Noah, who is a poet. And he wrote a piece um, imagining walking through the streets of Vilna with his grandmother as a child. Um, so that is it about the uh, for the tour today. We hope you access it. It's free. It's available online. And what I showed you is just a little bit of a lot of materials and the incredible story of Beba that you can follow. And as I said, you can explore at your own pace to stop and return whenever you like. And uh, we just want as many people as possible to view it using Beba's story as the starting point to learn about the broad historical context. And um, before I go, I just want to say that uh, it was also developed as an educational resource and we have um, teachers guides for use in classroom and um, it's really, we just really wanted to use it. So that's it. Thank you. And now I'm going to pass on to Michael. So two things to know about my mother, Beba Epstein. She was a Vilner. She loved Vilna, the city of her birth and childhood, and she was an immigrant. Nita Hare and Nita Hin, as she might have said, a proud American and Angelino, but Vilner to her soul. Although she lived to be almost 90 years old, anyone who knew her knew she was ruled by the four years, 1941 to 1945, starting when the Holocaust came to Vilna. She was a witness to one of the darkest periods of human history and experienced the worst of human behavior. She was never able to escape the memories and it colored her view of the world and of its people. She taught me a lot, the importance of family, the value of knowing one's history, our Jewish culture, all about Vilna, her birthplace, the Jerusalem of Lithuania. She was proud of her family's involvement in one of the great Jewish publishing houses, Rom Publishing. I learned to love reading, married a woman who loves reading, and have raised two children who love the reading. Like reading, I inherited a passion for music from both of my parents. My mother loved Chopin, Chopin the, the most, although in later years, I think Mozart was gaining. She was incredibly proud of Yasha Heifetz. He was from Vilna, you know. My sister Mary and I learned the piano as children, and that learning, although I did not become the concert pianist or conductor she hoped I would, has informed and enriched my life. Again, that passion for music has been inherited by our children. She was passionate about Judaism, about Vilna, about Yiddish, about her friends, and most of all, about us, her family. She loved us all fiercely, and you could see it in everything she talked about. Up to her last days, the same questions kept coming. How are you? How is your business? How about Sharon? How is Ariel liking camp? How is her volleyball? How is Noah? Is he getting ready to go to college? Can I read more of his poems? How is his girlfriend? Is she nice? Do you like her? When can I see her again? Her last big wish to me was, I want to come to dinner at your house. I regret we could not make that happen, but I can console myself with the hundreds of times that it did. Another thing to know about my mother, her own self-image to the contrary, she was a survivor. For some reason, she viewed herself as weak, although the facts continually contradicted her. Numerous times after the Nazis came to Vilna in 1941, she beat the odds and survived, from the selections to the work details in Gestapo headquarters, to the inhumanly crowded rail cars, to the death camps, to the barge on the, Malt on the Baltic mined with explosives on which she was placed, with bombs dropping all around her, semi-delirious and weighing 73 pounds. She beat the odds again coming to America and finding my father. As I understand it, my sister Mary and I were pregnancies four and six, the only two who survived. She kept trying, and when she kept at something, she was pretty hard to stop. Just like when she had an opinion, you were going to hear it whether you wanted to or not and she had lots of them. In 1966, my mother had breast cancer. She beat those odds again. She survived and thrived. It never came back. 
this in a community of Holocaust survivors whose ranks started thinning in the 1960s when catastrophic diseases and conditions started to take them. Those were things that she was able to do. Something much more difficult was for her to be happy. I always believed that she could not allow herself to be happy, that to be truly happy would be a betrayal of the family she lost in the war. So in spite of the wonderful life that she and my father co-created for all of us, she had trouble appreciating it. And in a way, she has always been an ambassador to the Vilna of her youth, a city of a hundred synagogues, a vibrant Jewish culture, publishing companies, artists, musicians, poets, commerce, beautiful nature. On her gravestone, we wrote in Yiddish, Tochter from Vilna, daughter of Vilna. Even though it was impossible to forget her, she felt forgotten, not noticed. She believed wrongly that no one cared about the Holocaust, that no one was interested in her story. My mother and father passed in 2012 within seven weeks of each other. On my mother's side, because of the Holocaust, the family is very small. So when they passed, the flow of information from the older to younger generations stopped. Whatever questions we had failed to ask her, that was it. There was no one to ask, no new information to be had, or so we thought. One day in fall of 2017, Mary contacted me. She'd gotten an email from a good friend of my mother, a lovely woman, a Yiddish lover and scholar named Sarah Moskowitz. Sarah's grandson, who was living in New York, had seen an article in the New York Times about a treasure trove of documents discovered in the basement of a church in Vilna, now known as Vilnius, and had forwarded it to Sarah. The article contained information about many aspects of the discovery, but one stood out. It was the collection of autobiographies from young kids throughout Lithuania and Poland, commissioned by Ivo in 1933. There were hundreds of these autobiographies discovered in the cache of documents, and the Times had decided to run a photo of one of them in the article. Sarah forwarded the article to my sister who contacted me. When we saw the photo, we knew it was our mother. And at an age that we had never seen, she was 11. We had a photo of her as an infant, one where she was probably around four to five years old. And then because of the loss of family and artifacts due to the Holocaust, the next photos we have of my mother or had ever seen are of a 23 to 24 year old Deva Epstein. Still, we knew it was her immediately. And suddenly there was new information, new stories, new histories, new photos, new revelations, a well-written, insightful, articulate story from a bright young girl, my mother writing about her life with her parents, her siblings, none of them had I ever met. So the idea that now and for future generations, my mother could be your guide as you discover and navigate pre-war Vilna and the 500 year old Jewish culture that ceased to exist in just four years. The idea that my mother could introduce you to her way of life, to her experiences, to her city. Well, I think she would be proud. I think she would be beyond proud. It's poetic in a way. Beba Epstein Leventhal is still a survivor and still an ambassador. As a proud father, I want to flag, and Carolina already did this, but I'm going to do it again anyway, that on the last page of the exhibit, my son Noah, who is completing his master's degree in creative writing and poetry, something my mother loved deeply, has written a beautiful contemplation on my mother, on the meaning of history and time. It makes me cry every time I read it. Do not miss it. And the exhibit is not just an important historical artifact. The backdrop of the story my mother tells and the story that Carolina, her team, the museum and the archives so beautifully tell is one of creeping fascism. My mother and everyone in Vilna lived through the darkening shadow of Nazi Germany and the fascist movements that were growing throughout Europe. Experience what she experienced and you will see it yourself. And you might recognize a bit of it in what is happening here in the US right now. Do not be fooled, my mother would undoubtedly say. It can happen here. Pay attention. Another story to emerge from the later part of the wonderful Evo exhibit is my mother's challenges in immigrating to the United States. 
First of all, somewhere in the Evo archives, I believe there is a letter from the early to mid 1930s from my grandfather to a brother of his in the US asking for help in emigration. That letter went unresponded to. The family, other than my mother, did not make it out. Even my mother, after the war, had difficulty coming to America. It was only through the heroic efforts of my great uncle, Lazar Epstein, that she was able to make the voyage to New York. By the way, in the exhibit, you can see, and I think you did see just for a moment as Carolina scrolled through it, exactly what she saw from the ship she was on as it entered the New York Harbor. The warning for today is when the world closes its doors to the persecuted, suffering happens, sometimes on a grand scale. Let us not continue to make that mistake. My mother might say, thank you all for showing up, for caring about a little girl from Vilna and about her vanished world. Come inside and take a look around. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. That was unbelievably moving and powerful to hear. And it brings so much character and life to who your mother was as an adult and the importance to her for sharing her story and educating on the Holocaust and understanding the social relevancy of the history. So thank you so much for giving us a piece of her. Thank you. It was really incredible. Um, you know, as a grandchild of Holocaust survivors, it's just, it's so meaningful to see other descendants who feel passionately about their family stories and feel that it's that what they went through and the resiliency that they embodied is an imperative really for the community. Yeah. So as People we sort of ask me sometimes, you know, how did your mother survive? And my general answer is one moment at a time. Is it, you know, that's what it was. So yeah. Um, so as we, we um, this is a great time for participants to drop some questions in the Q&A. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's just, there's so much incredible information that has been shared in the last 40 minutes. And I guess um, my first question would be for Michael. And what was it like working with Yivo to put together all of these pieces of the exhibit in your mother's story? Um, did you learn anything new from the experience um, that you did not know previously? Oh yeah, there's a, first of all, to answer the first part of the question, it was great working with Evo there. You know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful organization. Um, Jonathan, Carolina, um, were very respectful of, uh, of, of my mother's, you know, autobiography and of her legacy. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of stayed in the background. They, they were, uh, they did the work um, and they would every so often check with me and say, you know, this is what it looks like. What do you think? Uh, and, uh, you know, I always liked what I saw because they were doing excellent work. So it was it was easy and it was a pleasure and it was really cool to watch it kind of uh, take shape in terms of whether I discovered things that I didn't know. Yeah, there's, you know, I mean, I, I, there are photos I hadn't seen before. Um, the, my, my uncle or my great uncle, Lazar Epstein, his his artifacts, um, you know, are are at Evo as well and which include all sorts of stuff from our family, postcards I sent him as a kid. And, you know, there's just an immense amount of information out there. And then of course, because uh, Evo has, as, as you saw, they have, you know, all sorts of information about the Sofia Gurevich um, school and the Real Gymnasia. I got to see things about my mother's life that I didn't know because she didn't really talk about this stuff that much. She talked about some of it, but she used to talk more about Vilna in general, it was really hard to get her to talk about her own specific life, and in particular, the life before uh, and before the Holocaust. So, yeah, there's a, a lot, a lot that our family has learned. Uh, you know, a lot of experiences we've gotten to have because of this whole, you know, gift from the heavens. And uh, I, I just want to add that um, you were talking about Lazar Epstein, Lazar Epstein's archive, and this was also a discovery for us. Um, so Lazar, he, he um, his papers ended up at Yivo for an unrelated reason. So he was a member of the Bund here in New York. He was uh, a prominent member. So his archives were transferred to Yivo along with all of the Bund archives in the 90s. And um, uh, it was a process of discovery for us as well. So when we realized that we had his papers, so we started 
researching and going into his archives to see what we could find. And what we find was a treasure trove of documents. Um, he was an amazing so, guy himself. Yeah, I can only imagine. And uh, we are so grateful that he kept so many things, so many personal documents were in his paper. So there were letters from your grandparents, Michael, to him. There were letters from Beba to him. There, were, um, there was even a handwritten note from one of Beba's uh, brothers, which is likely one of the very few things that was left behind uh, by him. And, uh, and we also found all of a lot of documents pertaining to her immigration process. So we know what the story went like from her testimony that we uh, showed that we used some snippets. But uh, Lazar kept, for example, she started trying to find Lazar by writing a letter to the forward in New York, because that's what her father used to tell her, just write to the forward. He didn't see this letter. Um, he found her another way, and you can see it in the exhibition in chapter nine, but he kept that letter. He also kept all the communications that he did to other people trying to find her. She was first denied, and we he kept this denial letter, and we have it in the archives as well. So it's great to see that there is this oral history that comes to life with all of these documents that we could find. So this was really special. Yeah, yeah. And I, I it's... As I mentioned earlier, the Holocaust is such a large and complex history that I think it's really important that you guys took this, this one story, this micro history um, as an example for the larger context and the larger stories. And Carolina, as the curator, you know, what was your intention with that? What were your goals? What did you hope for when you were sort of putting it together? And do you think you achieved it? Um, so, uh, when we were doing this, I think the idea was always that from a person's life, you can then expand into so many different topics and you can give not only context, but meaning to these documents as well. So when you, if you just go, if you, I just went to a person and I showed Beba's denier letter from the, uh, from the American legation in Stockholm, a lot of people would be, yeah, so why, why should I care about this? It's a, it's a piece of paper. A lot of people have these pieces of paper. But if you follow her story from beginning to end, you care about her and you care about knowing what happened to her. And then you start, okay, but why did this happen? What, what is the broader historical context that led to this moment, to her uh, being in the middle of the war, to her whole family being killed, to her hiding with an outside family? How did this come to be? So it's um, you, the idea was always to make these connections as you went to toggle back and forth between her story and the bigger historical context. Um, and I do think that we were very successful in that, that we really achieved uh, this goal that was set out in the beginning. But, uh, but also the, uh, the thing is that when you talk about um, a society and you generalize it, it's always easy to fall into stereotypes. And if you go into one, the story of one person, it is that person's experience. And then you can show how that, person ex how that person's experience was influenced by the bigger historical context, but you're not generalizing and saying, everyone's life was like this. Everyone had the same experience because that is not true. And this is what we are trying to do here. It's. Uh, to break stereotypes and we are going to do this one story at a time essentially. So I guess my question would be why what, what how did you guys choose Beppa's story? What what came first, you know, did you in, set out on, on doing this one story at a time or did Beppa's story inspire that? What made her story so instrumental for teaching this history? Um if I may um preface of uh, what Carolina will say. I would say that we didn't choose Beba's story. Beba's story chose us. Um, it was a remarkable thing to find the autobiography of a young girl that had gone through so much. Um, first, it was a part of the Evo collection that the Nazis were intent on stealing. It was buried in the Vilna ghetto. It was then dug up and it was put in a museum. The Soviets came and wanted to destroy everything in that museum. For some reason, and the reason we don't know yet, Beba's autobiography was among those materials saved by a Lithuanian librarian and as Michael said, put in a church where it was hidden 
from 1948 to 1991. In 1991, these materials came to light, but her story didn't come to light until 2017 when another round of investigation of the, of the collection was made. And so in a way, it seemed as though her story was really asking to be told. And, um, and, and because she is such a vulnerable little girl and because her story has such a uh, quality of authenticity in it and her voice is so strong and also because it shows us what life before the Holocaust was and then uh, life after so that a, a circle is completed. It seemed like the ideal way of beginning uh, our online museum. It's yeah. absolutely incredible. Um, Carolina, did Thank you wanna you. say something? Yeah, and I just wanna, yeah, no, I just wanna add that uh, uh, it was suggested, I mean, when I arrived at Evo, it was a bit later and everyone knew about Beba's story and it was suggested maybe you should look into this because it's a really interesting autobiography. And reading that, what really struck me the most was what I said in the presentation. It's how much her life was uh, similar to that of so many children today. And I thought this, uh, because we wanted to reach one of our main target audiences, our school children, and we wanted this to be an educational resource as well as available for a broader audience, um, that uh, it really struck me that a lot of kids could um, identify and relate with her. You know, she, loves her family, I want to go to college, I love, I love learning, I want to go to school. Um, summer, her summer, we even made some uh, little activities, some little games with her favorite summer activities, which are swimming, yelling at the lady that sells things on the street, and running in the street and watching out for the cars. And these are all, they may seem like little things, but they create this identification that I think will resonate with a lot of kids today. Yeah, and I think, you know, not that I had any um, part in the decision process as to which one to choose, but the fact that she survived um, and that, um, you know, and that there was family, um, you know, us, I think it helps make it even more compelling. Yes. Uh, and yeah. Uh, I, I oh. just want to add that Evo uh, as a kind of bookend to uh, uh, Beba's story has the immigration history of Anne Frank's family. Uh, all of the letters of Otto Frank to American uh, uh, immigration services and the constant denials. And so these two stories uh, sort of complement each other, both in the figure of, uh, of a young girl, but also in the sense of one immigration story that uh, is a failure and ends in death and the other that through a great many difficulties is actually a success in the end. Uh, and uh, that also is an important story to tell. Um, it's important for, for people not just to focus on Anne Frank. Uh, and as brilliant as she was, there were so many other brilliant young people who did not survive. Of course, and it gives a larger contextual understanding of the Holocaust. You have Bebe from Eastern Europe. Um, Anne Frank was in Western Europe. You have Bebe who was a concentration camp survivor. Anne Frank was a hidden child. And then I think what's really you know, incredible as you all have all mentioned is that you then have her story afterwards. You know, For us to understand or to try to grapple with how did people go through such an horrific, abnormal experience, and then be able to function in everyday life. Um, you know, how does somebody survive Auschwitz and then drive a car and stop at a stop sign um, or pay for their groceries um, or raise a family? And I think that what's really unique about this is you can start having those really important conversations about human resiliency. Um, and as Carolina was saying, these are subjects that are related to students today who might be going through their own traumatic events and to see the ending of this for Bebe, the fact that she went through all of these things 
and had this incredible capacity um, to continue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I just want to, again, thank you guys so much for joining us and sharing this unbelievable story of Beba and this incredible moving um, mu virtual museum that is so much more than that. It's such an incredible educational resource. We're so fortunate to work with you, to partner with you, to learn from you, and to share this with the community. We really are fortunate in that. And Michael, thank you so much for coming and speaking to who your mother was as a person, adding this personal connection and really sharing with us and making us feel that we all know her and really do know her story and her messages. And we really, really do appreciate all of that. So yeah. Very quickly, I just, there was a question in the Q and A about how my mother's experience affected my upbringing. That's, um, that's a book. So <laughs> I wish I could answer that one quickly or, or type it into the text, but um, it's, uh, it's long and, uh, you know, it, it's just, uh, it, it's a whole story in and it's of, of itself. What do you think your mom would say if she saw all of this material um, and this virtual museum? Well, my wife and I talk about um, um, terrestrial Beba and celestial Beba. And terrestrial Beba, I think, would be mortified at some of the private stuff that has been made public and might be, you know, might be embarrassed at some of the, you know, she was very, she was very private in, in certain ways, didn't want to, you know, air the dirty laundry in public and all that. But I think that celestial Beba would be very proud, and would, would love this and, and, and be honored to, like I said, to be, you know, your guide to, uh, to the place that she loved. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as we wrap up, I just want to thank you again, Jonathan, Caroline, and Michael for being here today. Um, for everyone in the audience, thank you for joining us and learning. Holocaust Museum LA brings you programs like today's discussion at no charge. If you are enjoying our programs, we ask that you consider supporting our work by making a donation to the museum at holocaustmuseumla.org slash donate or by becoming a member. More information about membership and a complete list of benefits is available at holocaustmuseumla.org slash membership. This Thursday, we invite you to join us at 11 a.m. Pacific for a survivor talk with Leah Frank, who herself was a hidden child and will be sharing virtually her experiences before and during and after the Holocaust. On Tuesday, March 23rd at 11 a.m. Pacific, we are excited to host Beverly Hills City Council member and former mayor, Lily Bossy, who will speak with our CEO, Beth Keen, to discuss her mother, how her mother's survival impacted her leadership. We hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much.